What's up, I'm Yujama, and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to be doing a part two to my last video that was covering generating API tokens. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how you can use those generated API tokens to validate users to allow them to see resources inside of your API. This is the solution that the Ebo API uses. It's probably like the most straightforward solution that I could wrap my head around, and it's very effective. So with all of that, let's get into it. So where we left off last time was this email that gives you your API key. And what we want to do with this API key is with each request, we want to attach it to our request and send it over to the API. And then the API will look at that API key, see if it's valid, and also increment the usage count to keep track of how many requests have been made per day. So if everything goes right, meaning that the user provided a valid API token along with their daily usage count not being maxed out, then they can have access to whatever resource that they're requesting access to. So if we go back into router.js, we can see for each of our get requests for words and examples, there's this new middleware called validate API key. And its sole job is to validate the provided or attached API key. So we can see the definition for this middleware if we click into it. So this is the function. At first, it seems kind of crazy, but hopefully by the end of this video, it's a little bit more clear of what's going on. We're gonna first skip this API limit and start looking at the API key and host. What I'm doing on these lines is I'm looking inside of the request headers to grab the values that were assigned to the X API key and the origin keys. So whenever a user makes a request to the API, they need to place their API key inside of the X API key header. If they don't do that, then the whole validation process is gonna error out and tell the client that they didn't provide a valid API key. Along with that, the request has to have an origin header, meaning that the place where the client made the request has to be valid. So if you're inside of localhost, your origin is gonna be automatically set to localhost. If you're inside of your production application, like let's say it's myapp.com, then your origin is gonna be automatically set to myapp.com. So you usually don't have to do any manual configuration for this header. After that, I make a quick check to see if the API key that I provided from the client side is a main key. The main key in this case is a key that bypasses all in checks. So this means that it can make as many requests as it wants whenever it wants. So I created a couple of web apps that are consuming this API. So those applications also know what the main key is while the API knows what the main key is. So as long as those applications provide the main key, they're granted unlimited access. But for the rest of developers, they're not gonna have the main key and gonna continue down through these checks. This if block is responsible for development and testing purposes. If you don't provide an API key or a host, then the development server is just going to give you a fallback host and API key so you can continue developing for open source purposes. So at this point, whether you're a individual developer, you have access to the main key, or if you're developing on the API locally, you should have an API key and origin at this point. If you don't, then we're gonna throw these errors saying X API key header doesn't exist or origin header doesn't exist. These are required headers in order for the rest of this application to work. But if you do have your API key and your origin header is all set up correctly, then we're gonna move on. Next check that we make is to check to see if the API key is equal to our fallback API key. If it is, that means that we're probably inside of a development or testing environment and we just grant access. Then finally, we start to look for developers that match the information that was provided from the client side. So with the host and API that came from the client, we call the function find developer. Find developer has the logic responsible for making sure that the host value is matching the correct API key. So let's say that a bad actor grabbed access to my developer API key and they're trying to use it locally for their own projects, but they weren't matching the local host that I provided when I created my developer account. If that's the case, then they wouldn't be able to actually use my API key because they're not in the right origin. This isn't so much of a great security technique and it's not supposed to act as an amazing security technique because it's really easy to be able to spoof origins, but it's just one extra step that has to be unlocked in order to grab access to a stolen API key. So in this function, if the host matches localhost, meaning that you're doing local development, then we automatically just look for any developer that has the hashed value of the API key that was provided. So here we hash the API key, and then whatever that hashed value turns into, we're going to search for the developer with the matching hashed API key. So the hash function that we're using is the hash function that I walked through in the last video that lives inside of our developers file. 
what's going on here is when we pass in a value, which is our API key, we want to create a hashed value of that. So we use the SHA-512 algorithm along with using our application's developer secret token. So with all this information, we create a new hashed value of our API. And if we're able to find a developer with the hashed value, that means that there is a valid developer account using this valid API key. So this works for a developer who's inside of a development environment running in localhost, but let's say that a developer is deploying their application to production. That means that we want to also look for developers whose host is matching their production host name. So what we do here is we create a new MongoDB query that basically takes in the host name. And then with that host name, we basically say, look for any developer account that has host inside of its host key. So with this host query, we pass it into the developer find function. So what we're asking the developer model to do is look for any developer that has a matching host value. And then inside that array of developers, we want to find the one developers whose hashed API key is equivalent to the provided API key once hashed. So this function is hashed value key is responsible for taking a raw API key, like the API key that we sent via email, and then creating a new hash value of that and then checking it against the saved hash value of that API key. So we see that happening here where it takes value and hashed value and then we just hash the first parameter, which is gonna give us provided hash value and we check to see if they're equal. And then we return that one developer that we found or no developer at all. So this developer right here should be the matching developer with the valid API token. This means that the API token is either being used in development on localhost or in production, and its API key is matching as well. So then we check to see if the developer exists. And then if it does exist, we wanna do a couple more things before we allow it or grant it access. So what we're doing here is checking to see that the developers can still make requests within the given day. Each developer token has a limit of 2,500 requests per day. What we do to make sure that the developer isn't taking advantage of this API is check to see if their count is still under the limit. So here we have this function that says determine limit and it takes an API limit. API limit is specifically used for testing purposes, but in production, we use a prod limit or production limit. And then production limit, as you can see here is 2,500. So what we're saying right here is if the developer's usage count for the day is greater than 2,500 requests, meaning that they've used it maybe 2,501, then we wanna return back with the 403 status saying that you've exceeded your limit of requests for the given day. If a developer went over 2,500 for a given day, they wouldn't be able to make any more requests until the very next day. But if the developer is under their limit, then we're going to handle that case with the handle developer usage. We pass in the developer object and inside this function, what's happening is first we're checking to see if we're in a new day. If we're in a new day, that means we want to reset their count to zero so they can continue making requests for that new day. So if it is a new day, then we update the developer's usage count to zero. But if it's the same day, what we're going to do is just increment up the count and then update the developer's document. And once we update the developer, we move on and grant them access to the words and examples that they requested. But if the developer object doesn't exist, meaning that we couldn't find a corresponding developer with the provided host and API key, we're going to return back a 401 error saying that your API key is invalid. But if anything goes extremely bad during this process, an uncaught error is then caught, we're going to return back the client with a 400 error and then just provide whatever error message was thrown inside of the middleware. So this middleware is serving as a line of protection for the entire API. So as long as a valid API key along with the matching host has been provided in an API request, then that API is going to grant access to that developer. And we can see this in action inside of the API's doc site. So if we click on the docs link, they're going to be taken over to a pretty standard Swagger UI site. And we can see our four routes with words and examples. So if we go back to my email and I copy this, then I can go back over into our Swagger UI site and then I can authorize by pasting in my API key inside of this input box. And what this is gonna do is it's going to automatically inject my API token inside of the X API key header. So I'm gonna paste that in and then authorize. And then if I close out, then you can notice that all of the little lock icons are now locked, meaning that I have access to request any data from the database. So if we take a look at the get route for words, we can try it out here. And I'm gonna provide my keyword for cats. 
and if I execute it, you can see that this is the curl request that was made. So I made a get request to localhost 8080 API v1 words with the keyword cat, and then a couple headers that I set, but specifically the header that I want to focus on is that my X API key header has been set to what I provided inside of Swagger. And then you can see that I got a 200 response with all of the words that correspond with English word cat. You can also see this in action inside of Chrome DevTools. If I execute again, you can see that I made a words request with the keyword cat. And if we take a look at the request headers, you can see that my X API key header has been set to what I provided to Swagger UI. So as long as you provide the X API key header and your host is also matching, you can see that our host is matching with localhost 8080, then you'll be granted access to the API. As I was developing out this API, I didn't really think about granting access or thinking about security all too much. But with the more articles that I read and videos that I watched, I realized that APIs can be taken down so quickly. So I want to try my best to secure this API with creating developer tokens, keeping track of who's making requests when. That's it for this video and for authenticating generated API tokens. If you have any questions about this video, if anything was a little confusing, you want some clarification, please, please, please leave a comment down in the comment section below and I'll definitely respond back. I'm also on Twitter where you can send me a DM about JavaScript, the Evo API, web development, anything in between. I'll be happy to have a chat. And also if you want to contribute to the Evo API, I'll have links to the repo for any developers who want to contribute to open source projects and also the volunteer form for anyone who wants to contribute to the project in any other shape or form, whether you're an Evo translator, you're fluent in the language, or maybe you're a UI UX designer, maybe you want to write a couple of grant papers or whatever to try to fund the projects. Anything will be super, super duper helpful for this project. So I'll leave a link to that volunteer form down below. And with all of that, I will see y'all in the next video.